fell along. First and foremost, I want to give all praises, glory, and honor unto Yahweh, Bahashim, Yahusha. It's all due to the Most High. Praises to the due to the Most High through the name of the Son, Yahusha, that the world calls in Christ. Um, this is right, I've been God, and I want to go ahead and go right into this breakdown of the tribe of Okay. Let me go and without further ado, let me go ahead and go right, skip right into it. Uh Alright, this is the book of Genesis, chapter 49, verse 1. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. We're, we're in the last days right now. Genesis 49, chapter is talking about all the uh, bless, these blessings in, in Revelation that, of things that would happen to the 12 tribes in these last days, which now that, now this, now that the seal of knowledge is being let loose in the earth, and now that uh, our our people, you know, our brothers and sisters are beginning to wake up, we are now able to identify who the 12 tribes are. Okay. Uh, verse 2, and we're in the last days right now, and this is dealing with the 12 patriarchs who spawned the 12 tribes of Israel, which me and many brothers that are watching this video, brothers and sisters that I might add are, that are watching this video uh, are from. Verse 2, gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Okay, so that's self-explanatory. Now I'm going to skip to verse 3. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. All right, so when you deal with the uh, tribe of Reuben, Reuben means, see, it's a son. Rawabon, all right, in the Hebrew. All right, see, it's a son. It's being, meaning that he's his first son. Thou art my firstborn. Okay, he's his firstborn, my might, the beginning of my strength. Now, when you deal with the might and the beginning of my strength, usually the first son is always the big, the might and the strength of the father. He's the caretaker of the brothers. He's the first son that the father has, and he, the responsibility, responsibility and his uh, expectation is high for his first son. Okay? And it says the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Now, I want to touch on that because that's two folks that also is going into what I'm just what I was just speaking on the excellency of dignity excellency of power always goes to the first son now we understand now I'm gonna get a scripture that proves you know obviously that Judah ended up getting a uh, blessing over Reuben being the head tribe of all the uh, tribes of Israel but let me go ahead and get this let me go ahead and uh, break this down I should say when it says, my might in the beginning of my strength and the excellency of, and, and excellency of dignity, excellency of power goes into the fact that the tribe of Reuben is a great warrior tribe for the nation of Israel, dealing with the so-called Seminole Indians. Let me go ahead and go into it. Let's go ahead and go into it. First Chronicles chapter 5, verse 18. The sons of Reuben and the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, of valiant men, men able to bear buckler, and sword, and to shoot with bow, and skillful in war, were four and forty thousand seven hundred and three score that went out to the war. So the sons of Reuben, so-called Seminole Indians, the tribe I'm breaking down right now, the Gadites, which obviously the, um, which also, um, which also are the North American Indians, the other tribes of Indians, in North America, and the half tribe of Manasseh, which is the so called Arawak Cuban Indians, all right? Valiant men able to bear buckler, sword, and shoot with bow, and skillful in war, okay? So they were, uh, so when you deal with the so called Seminole Indians, who I'm speaking of right now, skillful in warfare, able to sh uh, bear buckler and shield, weapons, um, and able to shoot, and skillful in warfare, skillful with the bow. So that's the quality of them. Great, great warrior tribe of the nation of Israel. Okay, of the three great warrior tribes. So I'm gonna touch on a brief point to make about the strength and dignity of the so-called Seminole Indians. All right, um, this is out of the book, and I don't have this book. Um, I'm just reading an insert out of this book that somebody reposted on this page 
it's called Florida, uh, Florida 1513 to uh, 1527. And this section is the Spanish and Spanish and Indians. All right, because before before and that, that's the section. So before they were called Seminole Indians, there were different tri tribal names like the Calusa and other different uh, names because they were given the name Seminoles later on, as we know that know of them as today. But they're the different indigenous tribes in uh, Florida had different names prior to the slapping of the name of the Seminole Indians. I just want to make one more uh, point before I read this quick. Uh, quick insert I wanted I also wanted to say too because a lot of people will try to you know you have some people that are sitting up here trying to debunk the the, um, the 12 tribe charter debunk this truth and doc and doctrine in general be like oh wait a second there's only a couple Florida uh, there's only a couple uh, tribes in Florida you know what I'm saying and the census have this this amount of people. Well, we know according to prophecy that that's not the truth. We know that <clears throat> there's a lot of Seminole Indians that are scattered throughout throughout Oklahoma, Texas, as well as Florida. You know what I'm saying? As well as there's there's other as well as there are scattered through a lot a lot of parts of the East Coast. So, you know, I just want to get quick edification on that. So I'm gonna read this part. The Spanish invasion of what is now Florida began in 1513. At this time, there were at least 200,000 Native Americans living in the area, even before the first Spanish explorers set, uh, set foot in Florida. European diseases had begun to impact the Native populations. Smallpox had been carried to the Calusa by Native people from Cuba, uh, Cuba. The Native people of South Florida were well aware of the Spanish from the reports from the Natives of the Caribbean Islands with whom they regularly traded for centuries. So I'm going to go all the way down. I'm going to read uh, a quick thing about uh, what happened to Ponte de Leon. Um, so I'm going to start, I'm going to go all the way down to this part. The Tim, uh, the Timuka, uh, t the t Timucua warriors attacked Spanish soldiers as they were attempting to cross through a lake. The Tim Timucua, um, Warriors fired arrows at range at a range of more than 200 paces with great precision. Spanish armor proved nearly worthless as the armors uh, Salakia. Spanish armor proved nearly worthless as the arrows, tipped with snake teeth, bone, or flint, penetrated the steel. In spite of this, most of the Spanish soldiers survived. Uh, farther north. The Spanish carried out an unprovoked surprise attack against the Appalachian village of Appalachian. Even though this was one of the largest Appalachian villages, the Spanish did not find the treasures they were seeking. They found only corn, deer skin, and woven clothing. No, woven clothing, and corn, and grinding bowls. There was no gold. So I'm going to keep reading on because that part is very significant because about the Spanish armor proved nearly worthless as the arrows tipped with snake teeth bone or flint penetrating the steel because when you look at what happened what the spanish did to the, uh, what the conquistadors did to the people of the people of uh central and south america their weapons proved ineffective against the spanish army you know what i'm saying against approved uh ineffective but when they came against the Seminole Indians, in dealing with that strength and excellency of dignity, that you know, what I'm saying that strength and power that they had, their their weapons were able to penetrate the armor. You know, what I'm saying with it, like it says, Spanish armor proved nearly worthless as the arrows tipped with snake teeth, bone, or flint penetrated the steel. Okay, so I'm gonna keep reading. The Spanish continued their march into Audi country. They found that Audi was burned in event was burned or so lucky they found that the Aussie had burned and abandoned their village before the Spanish arrival not the Navarrez attempted was a fail a failure the Spanish found out that their crossbows were no match to the Indian longbows the Indians bows 
six and seven feet long, were accurate to about 200 yards. Furthermore, the arrows uh, tipped with the flint, bone, snake teeth, and fish scales penetrated the armor, um, penetrated the Spanish armor. Spanish horses proved worthless as machine as war machines in the Florida swamps and, um, and brush. So that so that right there shows you, you know, about the great level of warrior ability, uh, skills, and uh, in um abilities that the Seminole Indians had, that their weapons, the strength that they had was able to penetrate through the armor of the Spanish. Unlike how the, uh, the conquest all throughout the Central and South Americas, you know what I'm saying, they were, they were met with little to no uh, uh, resist, uh, resistance, while the Seminole Indians gave them more than they could offer. Okay? And this guy right here, Ponce de Leon, who led that, who led that exploration and conquest to, or, or or led that whole campaign in Florida. He ended up getting killed. Okay, let's see. Last, I'm gonna read this this out of Wikipedia. Last voyage to Florida in early 1521, Ponce de Leon organized a colonizing expedition consisting of some 200 men, including priests. Farmers and artisans, 50 horses and other domestic animals, farming implements carried on two ships. The expedition uh, landed somewhere on the coast of southwest Florida, likely in the vicinity of Charlotte Harbor or the Calusa Chachi River. Before the settlement could be established, the colonists were attacked by a large party of native Calusa. Warriors. Ponce de Leon was mortally wounded in the skirmish when historians believe an arrow poisoned with the sap of the Manchinil uh, uh, tree struck his thigh. The expedition, expedition immediately abandoned the colonization, attempted to return to ha uh, Havana, Cuba, where Ponce de Leon soon died of his wounds. All right, so he died because of, because of his uh, because of the attack. From the Seminole Indians, what we know as today, indigenous people of Florida. All right, he was buried in Puerto Rico in crypt of San Jose Church from 1559 to 1836. All right, so you know that's pretty much it on that. You know, giving you an insert and a understanding of how how strong the Seminole uh, Indians were as a warrior people and their weapons. So that's okay. what that's going into. All right. Now, when it says the excellency of dignity, it's a, that's a twofold thing as well, because it goes. What it ties into is the fact that the tribe of Reuben, being the first son, um, he has great dignity of himself. And because I want to just break some down too, real quick, because a lot of people can would try to confuse or cause confusion, get confused or cause confusion of saying, oh. You guys say North American Indians are the tribe of Gad, but then the Seminole Indians are the tribe of Gad, but I mean the tribe of Reuben, but they're all in North America. Well, there's no different than the Haitians. And that's that's like really when you when you understand this is why you have to do your research, read books, understand these tribes, because the tribe of Reuben and the tribe of Gad are different tribes. Even though they're in North America and they're all labeled as Na North uh, Native American Indians, North American Indians. It's no different than how the Haitians are, Haitians and the West, uh, the West Indians, the Jamaicans, Haitians, um, the West Indians, Jamaicans, Trinidadians, and Haitians are all in the Caribbean islands, but we all know that the, though, that the West Indians, Jamaicans, are different people than the people of Haiti. We understand that. We understand that from a cultural uh, distinction. That's the same thing that's going on with the uh, tri tribe of Reuben and the tribe of Gad, which is so-called Native American Indians, and North American Indians, and the Seminole Indians. Now I'm a now dealing with that, dealing with that dignity. They deck themselves out with more uh, glorious, more more uh, glory or glorious apparel. You know what I'm saying? They when you look at someone like S. Oscar Ola. You know, one of the chief chiefs of the Seminole Indians, or when you deal with, I believe, Wildcat, you know what I'm saying? You deal with certain of those Seminole chiefs, 
they that that's in when you deal with the Seminole Indians in general, their thing theirs has more brighter, more beautiful, more uh, glorier uh, apparel that they wore. Okay, that's and when you in con like even when even with like the Mitri when you deal with the Mitri when you deal with the the uh, what what else the Mitri as well as the turban that they wore which also proves the fact that this, these Seminole Indians this tribe of Reuben are are Hebrews the the Mitris and the and the turban the apparel of the the Seminole Indians and the other North American Indians they're their apparel is different when you deal with the uh, Mitri and the turban with the Seminole Indians, the more decked out, more glorious, more brighter colors, more more um, aesthetically pleasing uh, apparel that they was wearing in comparison to the tribe of Gad, the Native American Indians who were wearing cowhide, who was wearing uh, like bear pelts, um, rougher, you know, uh, rougher type pelts like that as as well as wearing the war bonnet you know with the feathers and whatnot okay even the things that they were even when you deal with the dwelling places that they have the teepees versus the the places that the uh, Seminole Indians were living in it was just it, there theirs was more brighter more beautiful versus the teepees that the Native American Indians was living in more rough okay so that's that's a clear distinction right there, okay. Now also too, actually I'm gonna go back into that verse, but I'm gonna skip right into the fourth verse. All right, uh, unstable as so uh, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power, verse four, unstable as water. Okay, when it says they're unstable as water, it, it's talking about their nomadic nature. They were nomadic, all right. They were a nomadic tribe. Okay, and and when you deal with the term Seminole, it means runaway. The reason why they gave them the name Seminole Indians is because they were hard to catch. They were they even even in war, you know, they were using the guerrilla warfare tactics. They were hard to catch. They were hard to predict, and that that even coincides with their personality. They're hard to predict. They're they're unpredictable. You know what I'm saying? They're unpredictable nature because when when you deal with the five civilized nations, the Seminole Indians being a part of that, they <clears throat> they all they were uh, defiant. Okay, they were defiant against the U.S. military by U.S. I mean the U, by the U.S. when the U.S. had slaves and they were given the five civilized civilized nations: the Chickasaw, Choctaw, Crow, or the was it the Creek in the uh, Cherokee and the Seminoles, they gave them uh, Negro slaves, tribe of Judah, gave them as slaves, but they were the ones that didn't keep, keep uh, the demands of the so-called white men because they allowed them to come into their tribes and come to intermingle with their people, all right, intermingle with, angle, intermingle with the women, you know, uh, men and women and whatnot, as well as them being exalted as uh, chiefs amongst their tribes, so that made the U.S. military angry. You know what I'm saying? And that was also that same remorseful spirit that they had is the same spirit that they had dating all the way back to Israel, dealing with uh, the uh, Joseph, who Joseph also bore the the other uh, the tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim. All right, let's go ahead and get that in the scriptures. Okay, because that's when it says unstable as water, that's what that's talking about. Them being nomadic, but also them being um, having that defiant spirit. And it also goes back into the verse in verse three, having the excellency of dignity. You know what I'm saying? Because they were they they didn't accept the the uh, treaties of the so-called white men like the other natives natives did. You know what I'm saying? The other native tribes did. They they were defined and they stood stood their ground and their dignity, you know what I'm saying. As well as spiritually, um, spiritually fighting and defending their brother, uh, their brothers, which which was Judah, the so-called Negroes. All right. So that same remorseful spirit that they had goes coincides with this what with uh, what took place with Joseph when. The brothers, brothers wanted to kill Joseph, dealing with the 12 tribes. The, uh, the other brothers wanted to kill Joseph because Joseph was 
highly esteemed amongst uh, amongst them with their father Jacob, and they wanted to kill him for that. Okay. Now, with that said, let me go ahead and get this. This is Genesis 37 and 20, and that's the characteristic of Reuben. Verse 20, Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into the pit, and we will say, Some evil beasts have devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it and delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. All right? It's Reuben speaking. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, that is this pit that is in the wilderness and lay no hand upon him that he may rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again okay so and I'm going to keep reading verse 23 and it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat in his coat of many colors that was on him okay so so um, just giving you that pre that scripture you know that that uh Reuben always had that, always had remorse for his brothers, you know, obviously being the older brother. Um, that same spirit, that same spirit was also the same spirit they had towards the tribe of Judah, dealing with the so-called Negroes that were in slavery, okay? Um, thou, uh, verse 4, I'm going to read verse 4 again. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defilest thou it. Uh, when he went up to my couch, so um, he shall not excel, and obviously he didn't excel because the uh, North American Cavalry, the United States military, uh, j guys like Andrew Jackson and and uh, General J uh, General Jessup, General Andrew Jackson, the great Indian killer, did a number on him. You know what I'm saying? And they didn't excel. And they even to this very day they still don't don't excel and they're they're confined in their own lands. You know what I'm saying? They're they're uh what do you call it? They're they're uh isolated, you know what I'm saying? So that's that's in the in the reason why, like it says, because thou wentest uh, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defiles thou it. He went into my couch, going back to the fact that Reuben Late, uh, earlier on went in went and took J one of Jacob's concubines and slept with him slept with her okay which is a, which is a uh, an egregious uh, uh, egregious um, um, sin all right it's something that um, a egregious violation of the law okay and the laws wasn't established until later on with Moses but it still was in our heart, in our in our mind, you know what I'm saying, even back then, dealing with our uh, forefathers, okay? And there's many scriptures to prove that, but uh, with that, let me get the precept to prove that, okay? We go on to 1 Chronicles 5 and 1, okay? Go back in the book of Chronicles, chapter 5, and I'm going to start at the first verse to prove that scripture. First Chronicles 5 and 1. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. So his birthright was taken from him because of what he did. So that so his house, the house of Reuben, would not have the the uh, birthright. I'm going to keep reading verse 2. For Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler, but the birthright was Joseph's. Okay, so the chief ruler became Judah, you know what I'm saying, even to this very day. Giving the uh, edification on the, the uh, and breaking down the aspect of the excellency of dignity, further proving that the tribe of Reuben are the so called Seminole Indians of today, and this cannot be, this attribute and uh, personality cannot be attributed to any other nationality or race of people on this planet proving who the so-called uh, Seminole Indians are the, are the tribe of Reuben of the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. So Genesis 49 and 3 Reuben thou art my firstborn my might in the beginning of my strength the excellency of dignity the excellency of power so the might the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power I want to pr prove these particular attributes attributed to the so-called Seminole Indians 
being the tribe of Reuben. Okay, through these books right here, I'm gonna go real quick because there's a two part aspect of the of that dignity. Okay, one is the outer dig outer appearance as well as the one in the heart. All right, so America's fascinating Indian heritage. All right, this is the book. This is a very good book. I use it dealing with the so-called uh, Native American Indians, which are the tribe of Gad. Use this dealing with the so-called Seminole Indians. Okay. Now, I want to prove from a visual aspect dealing with that raw uh, Salaki, dealing with the apparel. Okay, this is Oskaola. All right, and he's he was a Seminole chief during the time of the five civilized nations during the time of the revolt with the Seminole Indians and the and the United States government and the United States military. Okay, so you see how decked out he is. You see the bonnet that he's wearing on his head, a turban. You see the the chains. See how he's decked out. In contrast to how other Native Americans, in particular, are how they, now these are the like the Eskimos up in Alaska. I believe these are the ones up north in the northern parts you can see the difference between them and the Seminole Indians as well in contrast to trying to find like a picture in here in contrast to Slakia let me try let me find one to some of our indigenous brothers and sisters in North America and other parts okay so it's clear to see you know see him wearing the feathered the feathered war bonnet okay and the in the more rougher rougher clothing that he's wearing right here all right dealing with one particular native chief okay so you can so you can clearly see you know dealing, you can see the clothing right here this is one of the plains nation i believe this is the sioux clothing okay this is what the Sioux was wearing in contrast to what the more glorious appeal that this the Seminole brother was wearing okay this Reubenite brother was wearing at the time okay now I'm gonna bring out another visual aspect in this book called Black Indians okay by Lorenz Katz Lorenz, Lorenz Katz William Salak, my bad William Lorenz Katz Salakia. All right, and I'm gonna bring out one dealing dealing with this brother right here. All right, this Seminole brother, this Reubenite brother right here, with he, they called him Abraham Lincoln. Okay, not to not to be confused with the President Abraham Lincoln, but just giving you a visual look at the apparel and clothing, the more royal, glorious apparel that they were wearing. Okay, even the other ones around him in this picture. Okay. Now, also too, dealing with the second part, you know, and obviously you can clearly see the, uh, the turbans, you know, just more decked out, more royal, have that ancient, uh, have that slack of that, that, uh, ancient Israelite um, appearance to it okay like it says Reuben thou art my firstborn my might in the beginning of my strength in the excellency of dignity and excellency of power now that second part of that dignity I want to touch on not only dealing with their apparel and how they look and how they portray themselves how they how they carry themselves also too I want to go into the aspect of them fighting the United States military and not giving up okay and even even winning winning to a certain degree uh, their own personal province in a similar aspect to the Haitians who are the tribe of Levi okay winning over their province to be so, to have a sovereign um, le governing body of land over there in Haiti in a similar sense but not to the same extent because the Seminoles are still at war with the United States, but they did get to keep their own, be secluded amongst themselves 
in certain tribe with certain Seminole tribes in Texas with the black Seminoles as well as the ones in Florida and in Oklahoma. All right. So I'm going to read this section out of the same book, page 106. So, yeah, going into the part with the Seminole Indians uh, warring with the United States government. Their ancestors were mostly Creek with scatterings from southeastern tribes but in the 18th century they fled from the british from british control british dominated georgia and alabama and settled in in this in spanish controlled florida they came to be known as sem the seminoles more a loose grouping of people sharing a common culture than an actual tribe for a time the seminoles found peace and a degree of well-being under easygoing Spanish rule, but in 1817, U.S. G uh, General Andrew Jackson, the great Indian killer, I might add, led an expedition in northern Florida with his mission was ostensibly to round up runaway slaves who found refuge among the Seminoles. But in the course of this action, his troops engaged in an orgy of burning and looting and slaughtering uh, and slaughter. Slaughter. This was a mere portent a portion of things to come. Two years later, the United States purchased Florida from Spain and the territory became a hunting ground for armed poses of slave catchers who made little distinction between runaway blacks and their Seminole hosts. To escape these raids, the Seminoles fled to the edges of the Florida swamps, only to find scant sanctuary there. In 1829, Jackson became president of the United States and soon moved to deport all Indians east of the Mississippi to the plains, unwilling to join their brothers' tribes on the long trek west. Most of the Seminoles moved deeper into the into swamp, my bad, into swamps, and from 1835 and 1842, or 1835 to 1842, Salaki, they engaged in a bloody guerrilla war against U.S. troops sent to round them up. Only after 15. 80 American soldiers and countless Indians had died was most of the tribes subdued and sent on the long dolorous uh, dolorous uh, slacky, dol uh, dolorous journey to the Indian territory far to the west yet then a remnant of the tribe remained in the vastness of Florida's Everglades to foray, uh, foray out against federal troops dispatched to imprison them eventually the government wearied of the effort and effort and withdraw its troops leaving the seminoles who remain in the everglades at peace so this is a def this is right here reading this whole section to sum it up you know the seminoles kept fighting you know along with you know the negroes who are the so-called uh, the so-called uh, negroes who are the tribe of judah uh, kept fighting for their for the right to be sovereign and have their own land on the stolen land that they were walking on to this very day but in Florida okay and fought hard now I'm gonna reference something else out of the book black Indians all right I'm gonna go to page 63 this is all dealing with that dignity and excellency and might and strength and power okay all right to disrupt now dealing with page 63 all right. To disrupt their racial alliance, U.S. officials promoted slavery among the Seminoles of the five nations. Only the Seminoles rejected the kind of slavery the United States wanted. Wealthy Creeks who owned their riches to slave labor were sent to persuade Seminole chiefs to become slave masters. Whites and Creek Indians were encouraged to raid Seminole villages for slaves. Free Seminole men, women, and children were carried off and sold in southern slave markets. So this is a common tactic of the so-called white men to use, you know, pit our own brothers and sisters against one another. All right. Using the creeks, which which are this other tribe of Gad to help capture and enslave the tribe of Judah, who was already in slavery, as well as the Seminole Indians who who were who wanted them to integrate amongst them. The Seminole Indians and the Negroes were put in slavery as well. So let me keep reading. OK. So this is page 64. In 1835, U.S. agent Willie Thompson re reported they had equal liberty with their owners. They carried guns, 
were allowed to travel long distances, act impudently free. These were not slave, slaves, complained U.S. masters, but people who kept their African names dressed in fine seminal clothes or clothing and turbans, adopted seminal stomp dances, sang seminal and African songs. In this leniency, slave masters saw a grave threat to their nearby slave system. Seminal uh, seeds of revolution uh, might overtake their own plantations and bloody the countryside with racial outbreaks. Florida would not be a fit place for slavery until the Seminole, Seminole nation behaved like proper slave owners. Okay, so that all, you know, this is just tying into the to their great dignity, you know what I'm saying? And also, too, like I, like I mentioned before, how he went Reuben went back to the trunk went back to Joseph during the time of Genesis went back to Joseph and, and uh, had pity on Joseph and persuaded his brothers not to kill his brothers in the sim in the same similar aspect in the same spirit uh, fast forwarding thousands of years later having that same compassion on the tribe of Judah uh, who were the so-called Negroes who were slow sold into slavery and of the them being of the five civilized nations that were given slaves, they had the same compassion, e even to an even greater extent. To be honest with you, um, allowed them to intermingle, uh, intermingle Salakia with their tribes, as well as uh, make make them chiefs and and have and make some some of the slaves chiefs, and you know, just was a completely against slavery. Okay. And oppression again of their brothers, and that was all spiritual, okay. So they that was that that's part of that dignity, you know, what I'm saying that they had, you know, keeping that di dignity through a spiritual level, okay. Him being the first, uh, him being the first son, uh, the tribe of Reuben, the so called Seminole Indian. So I'm gonna keep reading in the same page 65, okay. Before this conflict was over, the United States had fought its most costly Indian war is spending over 40 million and losing 1,500 soldiers and many civilians. They battled an enemy, one US officer called bold, active and armed. And black Seminoles were more desperate than, than Indians. So right here, you know, this all proves man, the whole part. Let me reread it again. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, the beginning of my strength. They were might, mighty and strong, strong warriors. The excellency of dignity, them not giving up to giving giving up their dignity and their integrity to the United States, not allowing their brothers, the so-called Negroes, the tribe of Judah to go in slavery, you know what I'm saying, or treat them like slaves and fought for their land and fought to be defined against the United States, that uh, tying into their dignity and excellency of power, because you know them fighting against the Seminoles was one, like it said, like it said, was they were bold and active, and this cost them a lot of money, a lot of soldiers, and a lot of grief. You know what I'm saying? Dealing with the United States cavalry, United States military and government. Okay, so this this further proves that the so-called Seminole Indians are the tribe tribe of Reuben of the nation of Israel and you cannot f fit this description with no one else on this earth no other nationality or race on this earth than the Seminole Indians being of the tribe of Reuben okay let's go ahead and go into let's go ahead and go into Deuteronomy 33 33rd chapter yeah Deuteronomy 33 it's Deuteronomy uh, chapter 33 verse uh, 6 Actually I'm going to start at the first verse Because these are the blessings that Moses gave to the uh, 12 tribes Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 1 And this is the blessing Wherewith Moses the son of The man of God Blessed the children of Israel before his death Okay before his death These are the blessings that he would give the children of Israel Alright now Let me just get a precept in the Apocrypha he, him being in Mount Sinai, him, the Lord calling him up and whatnot. You, you would think that he would, he had him out there forty days and forty nights, okay. 
you know, for, he had him out there four days and 40 nights just for 10 commandments. There was, he was out there for more than just 10 commandments. All right. When the Lord, uh, had him out there. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and prove that because what he had also had him out there for is what I'm about to read right now. All right. Second answer is 14 and one. And it came to pass on the third day, I sat under a oak and behold, there came a voice out of a bush over against me and said, Ezra, Ezra, Ezra is speaking of Ezra. Okay. And said, here, here am I, O Lord, and stood upon my feet. Then said he unto me in the bush, I did manifestly reveal myself unto Moses and talked with him when my people served in Egypt. And I sent him and led my people out of Egypt and brought him up to the, to the Mount of Sinai, where I held him by me a long season. So he held Moses in Mount Sinai for a long season, 40, the 40 days and 40 nights. Verse five, and told him many wondrous things and showed him the secrets of the times, many wondrous things and the secrets of the times and the end and the end. So these are the things that, he, that the Lord was revealing unto Moses and commanded him saying, these words shalt thou declare and these shalt thou hide. So these things were hot, hid, the full understanding of what Moses uh, was was given to, to the Most High, the understanding and whatnot. All right, these were things that were hid uh, all the way up to this time that we're living in right now. All right. Now, with that said, let me go ahead and go ahead and go into this Deuteronomy, thirty third chapter, and the sixth verse. Let Reuben live and not die. And let not his men be few. Okay, so when you deal with the tribe of Reuben, it says, let Reuben live and not die, and let not his men be few. It's talking about uh, Moses giving that blessing to uh, to the tribe of Reuben, to Reuben himself in, in his house, um, dealing with the so-called Seminole Indians that let them live and not die. Because when you look at the census of, native, of the Seminole Indians, it's a very small number. Even the ones in Florida, Oklahoma, and Texas, all right, it's a small number. The Native American, when you deal with the Seminole Indians, uh, dealing with, like I've said before, Gen General Jessup and General Andrew Jackson, dealing with very similar Seminole Wars, uh, then the tribe, of, uh, the tribe of Reuben were slaughtered, okay? They were slaughtered through the Gatlin gun, through the cavalry, through various forms of weaponry that the United States military and tactics that the United States military utilize on our brothers and sisters, all right, on our brothers in particular, all right, and when you look at, and like I said, you go look up the census, there's not many of them in, in, in Florida, there's not many of them in Oklahoma, these are the areas, and in, in Texas, these are areas that they, they would normally dwell in, you know what I'm saying, but, uh, you know that's that's the blessing that he he blessed them with, so that they wouldn't be uh, fully wiped out. And obviously, the Lord is going to raise up twelve thousand of the tribe of Reuben, like like it's recorded in Revelation the seventh chapter. Um, twelve thousand men of the tribe of Reuben, for that matter. All right. So with that said, let's go ahead and get a book to prove the, the Seminole Indians. All right, who are the tribe of Reuben? Okay, so. I'm gonna. This is the Lost Tribes and Promised Land by Ronald Sanders. This is a great book. Actually, I'm gonna read the. I'm gonna read the, uh, the description on here real quick. All right, and this is a great book. A lot of brothers have it. I mean, you know, not much I can really say that most brothers brothers don't know. But if you do, if you do know about this book, if you don't know about this book, I should say you should go get it. You should go get the original copy that has some maps in it. You know, they, in this copy, they don't have the uh, maps in it. Um, I'm going to read this. Lost Tribes of Promised Lands is an utterly uh, revelatory work. And it says, Pre unprecedented in scope, detail, and ambition. In the pages of this book, celebrated historian and cultural critic, Ronald Sanders offers a compelling and ideology shattering history of racial prejudice and myth as shaped by politics. Uh, I mean, my bad, by polit political, religious, and economic forces from the 14th century to the present day. 
written with clear eye vigor, um, Saunders draws on a broad history of art, psychology, politics, and religion to inform his striking and soundly uh, reason assertions. And, and I'm going to say this too, when you read this book, this is not a lot of assertions in here. This is just a lot of records and recordings, all right? I'm going to skip to, I'm going to go to page three, 365, because this is not a comic book. This is our actual recorded events that occurred, all right? So this is page 365. Actually, page page 360. I'm gonna start at page 363. All right. Upon his return to Cartagena, the Judaizing Montezino had found himself accused by the Inquisition and put him in prison. Praying for salvation in his cell one day, he was reciting what was by then a standard formula. Now this is page 364, among New World Morenos. Blessed be the name of the Lord who has not made me an idolater, a barbarian, a Negro, an Indian. When he when suddenly he be stopped, those Indians he told himself they are Hebrews. So he said the Indians that he was that he saw, in particular speaking of the ones in Florida, were Hebrews. Those Indians, he told himself, they are Hebrews. Pondering this thought incre uh, incredulously and yet with growing conviction, he resolved that if he et it, he resolved that if he ever was released, he would seek out the Indian uh, Francisco and try to learn the truth. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip down. Okay, skip down to the point. Waving a banner high in the air, the Indian guy soon, and this is speaking of uh, friends, uh, that Indian uh, Francisco, waving a banner high in the air, the Indian guy soon was greeted by a puff of smoke far beyond the other bank of the river in response to his signal. <clears throat> the two men waited. Eventually, a canoe appeared bearing three, three men and a woman all of them Indians to the place where Francisco and Montezinos were standing at the water's edge. The woman got off and spoke to Francisco in an Indian tongue that Montezinos could not understand. Although he, he could perceive that he was being identified in the conversation, she then turned to her male companions to explain the situation. Upon hearing her words, they arose. I mean, my bad. They rose, uh, went over to Montezinos and to his utter astonishment said Shemay Yezreel Adonai Elihinu Adonai Eha Hear O Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one okay in, in the real Paleo Hebrew that's Shemai Yasha Allah Allah Hayanawa Yahweh Chachad okay which is Hear O Israel the Lord our power the Lord the Lord is one okay they have recited in Hebrew the fundamental credo of Judaism. So right here, he's recording that this woman spoke in Hebrew. Okay, so I'm going to keep reading. A brief conversation then ensued in their common ancestral tongue, according to Montezinos, who fluency in it is almost as perplexing to the reader of his narrative as it is, as is that of his three mysterious new companions. They told him that they were themselves of the tribe of Reuben. So these Indians that he met, these three men and women, all, they said they themselves, I'm going to read that again, they told him that they were them, themselves of the tribe of Reuben. Okay, so they identified themselves as the tribe of Reuben, speaking of the so-called Seminole Indians. All right? And that the tribe of Joseph lived on an island nearby, speaking of Ephraim and Manasseh, dealing with the Cuban Indians and the Puerto Rican Indians, okay? So they said that the tribe, tribe of Joseph lived on an island nearby because also Florida Peninsula, obviously there's the Caribbean islands you have to deal with. You can go on the, uh, if you have a, uh, a map, you can go look that up, okay? So the day when they were at last to issue forth into the world was coming soon, they explained, but in the meantime, 
they could not allow visitors to cross over, over to them. They were willing to make an exception in the near future, however, on account of their need for education. For though they spoke Hebrew, they could not read or write. Would Montezinos uh, uh, send them 12 breaded men, uh, uh, 12 bearded men to be their teachers? He said he would. The four strangers returned to their canoe and paddled back across the river and disappeared from view. So the point is, not only by uh, Montezinos' account, in this book, okay, um, dealing with these Span the Spanish people, they not only did the uh, Seminole Indians spoke Hebrew, all right, but they identified themselves as the tribe of Reuben, okay, in the Lost Tribes of Pro Promised Land by Ronald Saunders, you know, and and that just gives you further proof that they're of the tribe of Reuben, dealing with the so-called Seminole Indians, okay giving you a non-biblical reference and a non-biblical uh, non proof of them being of the tribe of Rufus.